again, thanks for, very much for coming. Um, we're going to do a, a little talk about Antarctica. First of all, uh, my name is Jeffrey Donenfeld. A uh, little bit about me before we really get started. Um, I, uh, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. Is this thing on? Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, um, but came out here to Boulder initially to go to, to, go to school here. I went to CU. Um, after that, I lived in New York City for about eight, eight and a half years where I worked in digital marketing, um, which was a, uh, uh, a great opportunity and a great industry to work in. Had a, had a lot of fun in New York City. Um, I've been into photography and the outdoors and sports and everything. story of getting to Antarctica, um, what life is like in Antarctica, and living at the South Pole, and how you can get there yourself. Um, so I've been living in New York City for about four and a half years, four years, and I loved my job in, uh, in digital marketing. I was working with a company called Morpheus Media. It was really great. And oh, and also, if you have any questions or anything, you can either stop me or save them to the end. We'll definitely have time at the end. Um, loved my job, but New York City. Entire career. Uh, I don't even know what's there or if there's anyone there, but I want to go there and live there. And I decided on it and I decided to do it. Uh, I started by Googling it and looking up the Wikipedia article on Antarctica and just starting from the very beginning. Um, I began to, began to build up some knowledge and uh, figure out that there are people there. There's all sorts of science, scientific research there, um, there's stations there, and it is possible to go there. There are jobs but they're extremely difficult. Um, and so I began to learn all the organizations that work down there, and ended up, uh, it ended up taking me about four and a half years, and I applied for about 45 different jobs every year for about four and a half years. <laughs> um, I applied to everything I possibly could, um, including HR positions, fuels positions, uh, uh, kitchen positions, maintenance positions, pretty much everything. And this was coming from working in digital media, which would have a lot of direct relevance. So I did everything I could. Additionally, I got all sorts of new certifications, everything from becoming a, a Hazwabber, so certified to, to handle hazardous materials, uh, like Dustin Hoffman, uh, as well as ServeSafe certified, so certified to uh, safely serve food and work in a kitchen. So broad spectrum for all these different certifications. I did everything I could. Uh, I did a ton of training with Knowles National Outdoor Leadership School, including living uh, in, the, in the Tetons for, for a month, living in, a, living in a snow cave, living like this for about a month, which was uh, an incredible experience and a lot of fun. And just worked my ass off, talked to everyone I could, and did everything I could. Uh, it took about four years still in New York City, uh, but I have come out to come out to Colorado to go down to Telluride with my two siblings, my little brother and little sister. And um, you know, this was after uh, a whole summer of hammering away, um, doing everything I could to get a job down there, really not getting any traction. I had gotten an alternate contract, but nothing really came through. And I was on this small road trip with my, with my siblings. Martin, HR, and 
double checked and I said, yeah, why didn't you know it? Yes or no? And the next morning I woke up and I had a contract to work as a cook in the South Pole Kitchen, which is an amazing opportunity. I have some cooking experience. I can certainly do that. It's at the South Pole. Uh, not the most common location to go. Most people go to McMurdo because there's more people. But I said, yes, of course. They said, that's great. The only stipulation is you have to fly out of Denver in five days. This was, uh, you know, this, I was in Telluride, I had nothing packed, um, uh, immediately got in the car with my siblings, drove back to, uh, to Boulder, to uh, my parents' house actually, and uh, packed up, I ordered about $8,000 of stuff on Amazon, got it shipped with my prime, <laughs> I sent my room surrounded by boxes for, for a day, uh, Pete threw, sent back most of the stuff, actually my father just said that there, sent back most of it for me, <laughs> and, uh, and flew out. So here's my trip to Antarctica. From Denver, I traveled through Los Angeles, uh, through Sydney, all the way down to Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, and Christchurch is the home of the uh, International Antarctic Program. This is, uh, this is home to uh, a bunch of different countries, uh, Antarctic Program, including New Zealand, uh, United States, uh, Italian, uh, and the Antarctic Heritage Trust, which is uh, like a historical preservation society. Um, here, giant warehouse where they give you big red poofy jackets, um, pretty much everything you need. Uh, you just show up in jeans and a t-shirt, and they issue you all the gear you need to, to go to Antarctica, including long underwear, hats, gloves, goggles, everything. Uh, so this is uh, just a little view of the, uh, the warehouse. Uh, you also get uh, a whole bunch of shots, <laughs> which was a little scary because I signed a paper and then the nurse gave me about six shots. I didn't know what they were, but I had to do it. And, uh, and finally, after about four days of, uh, of hanging out in Christchurch, New Zealand, which is beautiful, by the way, uh, geared up with all of my stuff, including um, my day pack and my boomerang bag. You can see that the orange bag, our emergency bag, uh, that we carry with us that has um, a little uh, extra gear and some overnight gear just in case the, the flight gets turned around in midair. Um, a lot of waiting. Light, a lot of standby to standby, and, uh, and finally we've got to board the, uh, uh, the Air Force's Boeing C-17 Globemaster III, an awesome cargo plane. This is the kind of cargo plane that they can load, uh, load tanks into, reconfigure for medical flights, put all sorts of giant machinery into, pretty much anything you can carry. Um, for Antarctica, they're, they're configured to, uh, to hold a lot of people, as well as palletized gear, all of our luggage, other supplies, uh, fresh on down. First stop was McMurdo. Here's a little shot of uh, the experience getting into the uh, getting into the plane. Uh, and I'm certainly a uh, better photographer I think, than a uh, videographer, but I thought these uh, this clips were kind of so you, can see, you can sit along the, the sides of the plane as well as in the middle. Uh, these are just kind of pallets of seats that they lay into the, uh, in the aircraft. I think it's just worth a pallet of, uh, of gear to so hold the whole track of So, there you go. Here's the inside of the plane. Um, an amazing, an amazing plane. And one of the coolest parts about it was they allow you to, uh, they, they allow you to uh, walk around the plane while it's in midair. So, um, as soon as we're at cruising altitude, I went up into the cockpit and checked it all out. Uh, really cool experience for sure. And then the uh, the view out the windows, um, going over the uh, the mountains and you're watching the sea give way to sea ice, give way to, to you know uh, some hard ice. And then look at the topography, the little mountain top peeking out of the ice. It's, it's an incredible experience. It's, it's really like nothing I've ever seen before. Um, so from Christchurch. Uh, um, about a six hour flight, um, fly down to McMurdo Station. And this is right on the coast, On a, a, it's actually on land, surrounded by sea ice, it's on an island called Roth Island. Um, and this is kind of the largest base uh, uh, within the United States Antarctic program. It's in the summer, it's about 1,500 people. Um, and uh, you know, it has major fuel reserves, lots of buildings, lots of lab 
laboratories, heavy machinery of everywhere. Um, it's also connected by a road going over to Fall Hill to Scott Base, which is the EV base. Um, super cool to check that out. And getting off the C-17. <laughs> Station. Um, I laid over there for for just one day. I had enough time. I wanted to check it out, but uh, it's just a quick quick layover. Um, one fun story I have. Well, the one fun story I have for McMurdo is it's not it's it's cold there. Um, it wasn't as cold as South Pole, but it's still cold. And there's a soft serve ice cream machine in the cabin. And um, right before I was going to get on my flight to go to South Pole, I got myself a soft serve ice cream. Walking with my bag, soft serve, just across. It's like a five minute walk. And um, at that time, you know, usually your soft serve melts as you're carrying it. And this time it froze solid. <laughs> so I got, on, I got onto the bus to go back down to the runway. I was like, oh, perfectly frozen ice cream. Cone. Awesome. Uh, so this is just a view um, from the observation hill. There's a, a hill that's kind of over McMurdo looking down into town. Uh, from there, tag your bag to the South Pole. And uh, Hop on an LC-130 Hercules. This is a, uh, a standard C-130 Hercules, which is really the workhorse of the military. It's an extremely versatile, um, reliable airplane. Um, but the L model is adapted with these skis. You can see there's skis on there that have slits in them. So you take off on wheels, land on skis. Um, quick shot, get me into the plane, and we'll uh, speed up a little bit here and bring through some good stuff. Uh, another cargo plane. A lot smaller, probably, but a lot of fun. Absolutely dry air. The propellers of the plane are roaring. They're, you know, they, uh, uh, they feather the propellers, but they, they're still spinning. And it's cold, cold, cold. Uh, people are there, happy to see you, uh, to greet you at the station. And, uh, and you can just look around, and all around you is nothing. It's only ice. Um, only ice. And, uh, and the station there. It. That's all you can see. So here we are at the, the South Pole Station, Geographic South Pole. Um, a few quick stats for you on the South Pole Station. And if you have any questions, just, just let me know. Um, it's at negative 90 degrees, which is the, the South Pole. Uh, it costs 153 million to build, uh, up to 80,000 square feet. And it was dedicated in 2008, although it, it took a number of years uh, to be built. Before this station was there, there was two previous stations. One station that was under a geodesic dome, 
uh, as well as uh, the older station, Old Pole, which was uh, which was another set of buildings uh, that has since been completely buried into the ice um, and, and subsequently dynamited so that it can't be uh, can't be accessed anymore. Um, physiological altitude, nine to ten thousand feet, uh, has to do with the atmospheric conditions as well as just the buildup of the ice cap at the pole. Um, and during the summer, when I was there, I got there in November and left in February. Um, there was 150 people on station. And, uh, and during the winter, which I did not experience, unfortunately, although we have a few people who have wintered over here, you can I'm sure answer questions. Uh, there's only 50 people, about 45 or 50. Um, the summer, negative 20 to negative 50, uh, although we actually got up to negative 10 when I was there. And it, the sun shines 24-7. You can see that the station has two different levels and uh, these four different wings coming off of it. It's also up on risers above the snow and ice. Uh, this is going to kind of keep it protected and allow the wind and the snow and ice to, to filter underneath the station so that it doesn't get covered over um, like, the, uh, like the dome did. Uh, look, this is actually a view from the rooftop of the station. You can see it's just nothingness all around, uh, which, is, uh, which is spectacular to see. Here's a shot of the... Uh, of the crew, and actually one thing I wanted to, to point out, uh, a cool thing about the, the station that I, I, I thought was nifty, is, uh, so this is, this is Destination Alpha, this is the main entrance to the station, here's our, here's our staff. You can see on the edge of the station, it kind of has a bevel right here. Uh, this is a deliberate bevel, and this is actually facing upwind, so the wind comes from this way. Um, and effectively, when the wind hits it, it kind of gets funneled down under the station and sped up a little bit, kind of like a wing. Uh, to help sweep out the snow and ice from underneath the station. Um, cool, basic design detail that, that works. Um, there's still a bit of maintenance that has to do, but it, it seems to work. Um, so, the South Pole. There's actually four South Poles. Um, I was at the Geographic South Pole, as well as the Ceremonial South Pole. The Ceremonial South Pole is centered outside the station. Um, when you buy a compass here at Neptune, Neptune um, and look at where it's pointing, the South Pole that it traditionally points to is actually not the geographic South Pole, it's the magnetic South Pole, and that's currently in the ocean. Um, I'll show you in the map later where that actually is. And finally, the, the weirdest South Pole is the Pole of Inaccessibility. That's the spot in Antarctica that's farthest away from any coastline and technically the hardest to get to. Uh, for whatever reason, the Russians set up a monument there uh, with a, a, a sculpture of Lenin. Uh, this is just a reference image I pulled off the internet. Um, it would be really interesting to check that out. Here's a quick picture of me at the, uh, this is the ceremonial South Pole, classic barber pole, and, and, uh, and you're all there, and there's a, there's a, uh, a, a semicircle of flags around it. Uh, this is the, the geographic South Pole with notably an American flag, only an American flag next to it. This is actually what the, the South Pole looked like when I was there uh, in 2012 to 13. Uh, every season, there's a new marker that's fabricated uh, during the winter, and it's unveiled um, on January 1st of every year. That's what it takes out. So my job at the South Pole, I did a lot of stuff. I was so incredibly excited to be there that I wanted to do everything I possibly could. that I was hired for was as the breakfast cook on station. Um, however, in addition to being the breakfast cook, um, I'm also a certified WEMT, and so I worked in the medical clinic. I taught one class a week um, on, on EMS and uh, helped out our doctor. I worked as a press correspondent and wrote a few articles about science and just life down there. Uh, I was also the one of the station's tour guides, so we would have tours come down, and I would give them a or the station, I'll talk to you more about that in a second. And then all my other free time, which was not a lot of it, but I worked as a field science assistant kind of on a volunteer basis. And a scientist who needed help, say, hey, I'll do it. I got you. I'll make the cookies. I'll carry bags for you. I will help fabricate sheet metal. Whatever it is, I'll help out, uh, which was a great experience. A little shot of me in the kitchen. I got to slice a lot of deli meat that had been frozen for 15 60 degrees, but uh, it comes back, tastes fine, uh, it's still alive. Some of these guys who've eaten it are still alive, so I think we're okay. Um, quick picture of the 
galleys. This is uh, this is where everyone kind of hangs out and eats. And uh, and notably, uh, you can see in the, in the galley there's these TVs. Um, the galley scroll that has kind of a rotating slideshow of flights coming in and out of the station. When we have satellite passes for data uh, for internet like Gmail and Facebook, it's very important. Um, weather conditions, how much fuel and water we're using, all sorts of. Very comfortable, and uh, you can see there's no light coming in my window there. The first thing I did was I boarded up my window with cardboard um, and put a red light in, in my uh, in my lamp so that when I turned the lights off, it was actually dark in my room. You can go out in the hallway three in the morning, go to the bathroom, and it's uh, it's excuse me blazing sunlight coming into the window. Uh, it's kind of crazy. Um, so there's my little MacBook, same same MacBook as I have here, and believe it or not, we actually did have internet. Internet is served by satellite, uh, by a number of satellite links. Um, this is actually the GOES 3 satellite uplink, uh, uh, right down with it. It's, it's called the golf ball lovingly because it looks like a golf ball as, as you look at it from, uh, from the station. Um, and in it is this giant satellite dish that picks up um, the signal from the GOES satellite. So it's confusing. This is the patch for the NASA's Kedra satellite, which is another data satellite we use. Uh, it's actually higher bandwidth, higher tech, smaller satellite. Um, this, interestingly, the one factoid I'll tell you on this is um, you'll notice that it's pointed horizontally, almost at the horizon. And that's because we're at the, if you think of the, the physics of it, we're at the south pole. And these weather satellites, the GOES is a former weather satellite, um, used to be on an equatorial orbit, which we can't see. We couldn't see that orbit from the south pole. GOES 3. GOES-3 is, is in a degraded orbit, so instead of orbiting around the equator, it's kind of skewed off a little bit. So it's uh, sometimes it dips into the northern hemisphere, sometimes it dips into the southern hemisphere. And it's during that southern dip in the southern hemisphere that we can look at the horizon and see it come just over our horizon and get a little data connection. Um, so interesting how, the, how we're pointing the satellites there. Um, another satellite connection we have is in multiple iridium channels. Those are all over the globe, and so we can we can get them from directly above us. Uh, quick view of the medical bay, full trauma center, um, ultrasound, uh, x-rays, uh, there's a desk chair, and off to the side there's two ward beds, uh, so you can uh, give patients extended care. We have the world's southernmost post office. Everything here is the world's southernmost, so we have a post <laughs> office. There's our, our stamp, and actually, um, uh, I forget what the name is, I received a couple of emails from people who collect stamps. Do you know what the name is for that? Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> uh, requesting uh, that I send them mail, um, which unfortunately didn't happen because of the, the timing, but it is interesting that they get people uh, requesting stamps from the, uh, from the South Pole. Recreation, huge. You can work a ton, and we do work a ton, but recreation is super important to uh, keep your sanity healthy and, and actually um, almost an entire wing of the station was devoted to this gym. In addition to being used as a gym, we used it as a you know, community center, uh, muster point, and a bunch of other things. We had, uh, we had movie nights there. Um, the station manager, Bill, did a little open mic on his, uh, on his guitar. Um, good stuff. And our, and our friend John right over there. Uh, we've also got, let's see, in, in another one of the uh, Another one of the wings, pool table, a uh, ton of VHS tapes, like a ton of VHS tapes, more than I've ever seen before. Uh, a very small impromptu bar and, and uh, an extra kitchen, which I can tell you about. Um, all sorts of stuff. Through this door here is another theater, which has a, like an Xbox in it and, and another ton of VHS tapes. Um, other facilities on the station, a greenhouse. Amazing to walk into the greenhouse. The best thing about the greenhouse it's warm, and there's warm places in the station, but it's humid. You walk into the greenhouse, and you can feel the humidity on your uh, on your skin. It's, it's really great. And actually, they nicely put a phone in there, so during the times when we couldn't make calls, you could get a family member on the, on the conference call, and you could sit in the greenhouse and feel like you were not in the barren, frozen desert anymore for a little bit. There's some plants that are moving. Um, in addition, 
into the above ground station. We have a few pictures here of the uh, of the parts of the station that are below ground or below the ice. This is known as the, the ice tunnels and the arches, and uh, these serve as uh, service and supply conduits uh, for the entire station. So this is going down uh, this, this service structure called the beer can from the above ground section below, about 50 feet below the ice, into the ice tunnels. You can see all these uh, water lines and electrical lines coming down below the ice. Um, this is also this is major insulation on water lines and sewage lines um, and into the ice tunnels. It's a constant negative 60 down here, and uh, it's a little scary to be down there. I mean, there are lights, but um, you can you can see the the wall foaming in, and actually every every once in a while they have to shape off the walls again to keep it to keep it square. Uh, there's major expansion joints and movable joints on all of these. So that as the ice moves, contracts, that uh, everything can move without breaking. Um, negative 60. That's only the thermometer that's there. I think pretty much strictly for photo purposes, because uh, everyone takes this picture. Uh, I thought it was cool though. And, uh, and deep, deep into the ice tunnels, um, uh, there is an interesting station that I had a hard time getting uh, getting data on, called the South Pole Gravity Station. I don't know if anyone's seen Lost here, but I was. I was seriously expecting to see the numbers etched somewhere around the gravity station, or like a big frozen wheel that I had to turn. You know? um, additionally, in, in addition to the uh, the ice tunnels, there's also these service and supply arches. So these are the arches that, that are now under the station um, that supply uh, the above ground station with all sorts of food supplies. These are all the food stores, tons of food stores. There's a power plant under there. The, the station burns 600,000 gallons of AM8 jet fuel, which is JP8 with an energy added, um, to, to power and to heat the station every year. Um, I hear it's something like 35, 45 bucks a gallon, uh, but it's a, it's a seriously expensive operation. Uh, these are the uh, generators that, that, go, that make all that. They uh, have heat exchangers for glycol for heating and also produce electricity. Um, there's those tanks underneath the ice, and here's the emergency hatch uh, for an emergency escape from those, those arches that are underneath the ice. So you can see it's just a middle of nowhere, and it's hidden under the ice. When planes fly in, we have a, uh, we have a military fire crew that comes out in their fire truck, kind of non-traditional fire truck, big treads on it, called Elephant Man. It's, uh, it's slow, but it gets the job done, and it's a lot of fun sitting up in there watching planes land. They, uh, they let me come out a few times with them um, onto the, uh, the skiway and, and just kind of watch planes land. Luckily, nothing happened, which is good. Um, so let's see some other science facilities. Here's uh, so here's the walk. Um, when I would go volunteer with the uh, with the scientists, um, most of the science sites, um, the major telescopes at least, are off station. It's about a 15, 20 minute walk away, and uh, this is what we would wear. These are our, our issued parkas and everything, and uh, take a walk over to uh, you know, Keck, 572, um, South Pole Telescope. Um, all of the, uh, the laboratories over there. Majorly cold, 20 minute uh, walk. It's a, it's a cold walk, but you know, you get there and we're, uh, we're people underneath, the, uh, underneath all, of our, all of our protective layers. A uh, couple pictures of the science experiments. This is, uh, this is the South Pole Telescope, a uh, big microwave telescope looking at uh, the cosmic microwave background Questions about that later. Uh, this is inside the. Uh, this is inside one of the the, the mounts of a smaller telescope um, called a Keck array. And this is actually inside the very heart of it. And you can see that these are all um, insulating uh, uh, pipes for liquid helium that are coiled all all around here, so that the telescope has a has a freedom of, of movement to, to look at the entire sky. I did get to help out with some pretty cool things. Um, this is uh, in the middle of taking apart one of the, uh, the cryostats, the big uh, cooler that houses the, the sensors and electronics for the Keck array. Um, so you can see taking, this, taking the lid off of this thing, or the, it's actually the bottom, and uh, this is kind of the main, the main vessel that can, contains uh, all the sensing electronics, and then this little offshoot next to it uh, contains refrigerator electronics that, that uh, recirculate 
uh, three different levels of liquid helium, uh, two levels of liquid helium four and one of liquid helium three, uh, and then a, a strap that's bolted on to uh, the conduct key. Uh, takes apart a couple of other other uh, other cryostats in the laboratory there. A lot of fun to hang out and uh, get some work done. In addition to laboratories like this that are that are a little cluttered but but usable, we also have a clean room at the South Pole. Uh, it's kind of makeshift, but it works and it lets us do uh, precision work. Uh, I mentioned liquid helium, and this is how we transport liquid helium in big doers like this. So this is going into one of the laboratories, the laboratory of the 572, uh, and you can see uh, the laboratory for the CAC array uh, over on the other side, and then way in the distance, this, this building there, that's actually the South Pole Station. That's, so that's kind of how far away they are. And this is this is just like a little a little uh, switching and, and power box that uh, connects lines that come under the ice from the South Pole Station. Um, we don't always have to walk. We get snowmobiles, and occasionally we get to take rides in awesome trucks like this, big giant trucks. Um, they're really cool to look at. They're fun to ride in, but they suck to drive. They have they have no turning radius at all. It takes forever. But luckily, we have unlimited space. <laughs> Here's another one of uh, the laboratories. Uh, this is this is the kind of the main nerve center uh, for the ice cube the neutrino telescope. It's a it's a cubic kilometer of ice that's been embedded um, with sensors. These are actually optical sensors that, that look at these blue flashes of light that are made by by neutrinos um, as they go through the ice. And all of the leaks from all the sensors that we're over right now uh, go into this major uh, looks like a server apartment. It's a big, big room. Another one of the big experiments that I actually helped out directly on, on a, probably twice weekly, um, is called R, the Ascarian Radio Array. This is another neutrino telescope that's uh, actually um, embedding the ice, a uh, larger section of ice with different sensors to look at neutrinos in a different way. But I was part of the team that helped build uh, this drill rig. Um, so we built this major drill rig that put hot water down into the ice, melted out a big hole into the ice, from that giant hole, uh, into that giant hole, we could we could load in the sensors. Um, it's a lot of fun getting to work outside all day, negative 30 degrees, um, and, and set this whole thing up. In fact, um, a lot of these cables here uh, is is my work. This is what I So uh, continuing on, let's see. This is a, just another shot of um, of the drill rig. This is actually the drill head being lowered into into that hole. And then another component of the Ascarian radio array is a, is a few sensors that are just a, a few feet into the, uh, into the ice. More science that happens at the South Pole. Um, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration here from Boulder, uh, their Atmospheric Research Observatory called Arrow. Um, one of the stations is down here at the South Pole. And notably, for this one, um, this probe here is an air sample probe. And this is actually, this, this whole facility is on the upwind side of the South Pole. And uh, of all the upwind side of all the buildings, this sample is the cleanest air in the world and helps set the ba base levels for global pollution. Um, it's really an incredible experience being up there. And um, I actually got to take home a little vial, a little like glass vial, sealed glass vial of air that I captured from this rooftop on this day. <laughs> that has a label on it that says, this is the world's cleanest air. <laughs> kind of cheesy, but true, and all. Um, let's see. We do a lot of work, obviously, at the South Pole, but we do a lot of play as well. Uh, there's there's a, a lot of fun that happens at the South Pole, including uh, dressing up uh, a couple parties and having a luau or two under uh, used uh, airdrop parachutes. Uh, we actually made an ice bar here. Uh, we burnt a few pallets in a big drum uh, to make a barbecue. And, and notably, there is, there is a, a little bit of beer uh, at the South Pole Station. And, uh, and I thought this picture was interesting. This is a picture of, of one of our coolers. This is actually an old electronics box. Um, but notably, and I'm sure being in Colorado, you guys have all seen these. Instead of putting ice in the cooler like we did back there with two beers, these are instant hand warmer packets <laughs> that we put in there to keep the beer liquid. <laughs> You can hold a beer in your hand for not very long until it starts to freeze. You kind of got to 
got to get to work on your beard. <laughs> A bit of my own recreation as well. I, uh, I ran the South Pole Marathon. This is actually not just the Antarctica Marathon or the commercial ones that happen on the coast. This is actually at the South Pole. This is me out on a skiway during the Sunday when it was closed. Um, and uh, uh, it was my best time. Like, a little over five and a half hours, which is, is terrible uh, by any standard. But I finished, and I didn't die, and, uh, and it was great. And what I looked like afterwards. Uh, everything had to be covered, and uh, every lap or two, every five mile lap on the skiway, I would take my neck gaiter and I would twist it about a quarter of a turn so I would get a new face in it that wasn't uh, clogged with frozen with ice and everything. So I'd keep it easy breeze. It was a delicate balance training for that. I mentioned tourists at the South Pole. I was one of the tour guides, which was a great experience, and there are tourists at the South Pole. I'm going to go over how you can get with one of these organizations. There are tourists. This is the NGO camp. This is the only place that tourists can, can stay uh, unless they're escorted onto the station. Um, tourists typically, uh, if they're tourists and not adventurers or expeditioners, uh, they'll fly down in either a, a, a DHC twin otter, one of these little things, a little prop plane with two props, or a, uh, a DC-3 basilisk. This is kind of an up, updated plane from the 50s. South Pole, most tourists, you know, take pictures, flags, requisite, photo taking everything, and then I would walk out to the, the pole, meet them there, and bring them to the station, tell them about it for an hour, much like I'm doing with you guys right now. Um, in addition to tourists, uh, this woman, her name is uh, Vilborg, uh, she's the first Icelandic woman to ski from the coast to the South Pole solo. She was on the ice alone uh, for two months, flight control, and this is when she actually made it. She had been uh, her sled and set up her tent before she actually made the South Pole. This is her skiing over to actually make the South Pole. Uh, we also had a, a bunch of other cool people. This is our station's doctor, uh, Dr. Sean Broder. He's the he's actually currently working for NASA as a, a, a lead flight surgeon uh, and formerly worked with the uh, International Space Station as their lead flight surgeon. And this is uh, the medical director for the entire uh, uh, program, uh, Dr. Scott Pierzynski. A NASA astronaut has flown on a number of space shuttle missions, as well as the uh, uh, the International Space Station. He, uh, he helped deploy the initial trucks of the station. Amazing getting to uh, getting to meet these guys. Uh, so, a couple more slides here. After three and a half months on the station, uh, it's finally time to go home. Um, it's kind of a a it's a sudden thing when you when you go home. It starts to get to the end of the they decide to pull people out, but there's also uh, environmental restrictions. Once the temperature hits negative 50, um, as we start to go into, into the fall, um, there's a mandatory evacuation of everyone who's not staying. And so the day that I left, uh, we actually did hit negative 50, and they called in all the flights they could possibly get to pull, and, uh, and we left. So this is the uh, this is really the final picture I have. Um, as the plane was landing with uh, you know the, the, the engines on, Run on out there, get on the plane, and as you're sitting down, they're gunning it off the uh, off the ice. It's um, they accelerate it quick, but it's a smooth takeoff, and smooth landing. It's an unlimited runway, so they just keep on going. They have five miles blacked out, but I mean the the ice uh, you know can be used if they need to. Uh, this is just a quick shot of uh, flying back to McMurdo, getting back to McMurdo. Finally, everybody uh, uh, gets called up to 
I drag, get on the bus, go back out to Pegasus Ice Runway, and hop back on a C-17. I was lucky I got a C-17, which is a fast jet. Sometimes in the middle of the season, if they don't have one of these, uh, you'll be on a, an LP-130 Hercules. It flies slow, it takes forever. Um, got back on the, uh, the C-17 and flew back to Christchurch. Coolest thing about getting back 